Um, so I was going to give a talk on the OWASP top 10, which is the top 10 uh, vulnerabilities in web applications. Uh, OWASP is a, they're a non-profit organization that was founded in like the early 2000s. Um, their focus is on trying to bring security related concerns to developers who aren't necessarily like security researchers. Um, so every year since like 2004, they've been coming out with a top 10 list, which are, that are the top 10 lists of all, um, hang on, of all of the um, like most severe, uh, most severe vulnerabilities in web applications. So I thought we'd take a quick spin through all of them, um, get some of the vocabulary down, and see how they might apply to some of our projects. So the most prevalent and severe um, vulnerability in, a web, in web applications today is injection, or in 2013, which is the most, uh, most recent version of the list. Uh, injection flaws allow attackers to relay malicious code through your web application to some other interpreter, or maybe perhaps even the interpreter your web application is running. Um, most commonly in our Rails app, this is SQL injection, but there are other kinds. So there's uh, system command injection if you use the system command or these backticks or kernel exec or things like that, um, and you pass user input to them, you're letting users define uh, what commands are running on your system. Um, so if you use these, um, like paperclip shells out to um, image magic for a lot of things. And if you uh, Paperclip makes use of uh, Cocaine, which is another library that John wrote that tries to bring some sanity into um, interpolating arguments into those commands. So if you need to do that, use a library like Cocaine or something like that that tries to help you do that, do so safely. Um, you can inject Ruby with things like eval, which we should basically never ever use. Um, even things like send or define method or constantize. Uh, I know on Reserve a Game we did a thing where you could reserve any number of things in the system, and it would take user input for the type of thing that you wanted to reserve, where you're reserving a tennis court or something else. Um, so we constantize that string. So to be careful, so uh, what could happen is somebody could sit in any string, create that object, and start sending messages to it. So we had to whitelist the objects you could create, things like that. So anytime you do anything dynamic in Ruby, if you're using any sort of user input, you have to make sure that you uh, whitelist those things to make sure that you don't leave your app vulnerable to Ruby injection. Um, the most common thing that we're prob that you'll come across is probably SQL injection. Uh, Active Record actually does a pretty good job at preventing SQL injection in most of its API, but you can get into real danger with strings. So if you see something like this, this is a pretty contrived example, but order pluck params column. Um, so you could imagine like an interface, a query building interface or something that says like, I'm gonna allow you to pluck the username column from this table or something like that. And I would return you all the usernames. But if I pass a parameter like this as the columns parameter, then my query ends up looking like this. Oh, that's the wrong query. Um, but it ends up looking like you can, you can query, this would be select password from users where um, and then the rest of the query would end up being commented out. So you'd end up being, you'd end up returning passwords. There's a whole bunch of these SQL injections um, that are documented at this website, rails-sqli.org. So if you're interested, you should check those out. Um, most of them have to do with when you pass strings to the active record object, so you should use hashes um, wherever possible, because Rails can do a better job at sanitizing those. The second most uh, the second most important vulnerability that they highlighted in 2013 was broken authentication and session management. Um, in a lot of communities, writing your own authentication and session management is something people do often, like on every project. Um, I think on most of our Rails projects, we're using clearance or even or devise or something that is takes care of this concern for us. So I don't. Re this isn't really a concern too much in the in the Rails world, um, but it does happen often at other places. Um, you know, just this week on a client, I was trying to explain to them why their session management was prone to session hijacking. Um, so rolling your own session management is always something that you want to undertake with great caution. The third most prevalent is cross-site scripting, which is a type of injection, a specific type of injection. Um, 
So that's what allows people to inject JavaScript into a page. Once they have JavaScript on the page, they can access the session, co session token, they can make remote requests, things like that. Um, and they can post those externally wherever they want. So some common cross-site scripting vectors in Rails applications would be if you did something like this, or so product name is, um, you know, assuming the name was provided by user input, just calling raw on it would um, negate the default HTML safety that Rails does in ERB views, um, or calling HTML safe similarly. Content tag, that's kind of a tricky one, does the same thing. Oops. And this last one's kind of sneaky, like if you have a user profile where the user gives a website, so this ends up getting injected into the href where you can put like JavaScript colon, whatever you want there. So those are things you need to be on the lookout for. A lot of times you end up needing to have some sort of markup uh, in your site. So if you're gonna do that, um, I suggest using markdown with HTML tags turned off. So you have a very restricted set of HTML that the user can generate. Um, if you absolutely have to have HTML, <coughs> there is a um, gem called Sanitize, I believe, which tells you, which lets you say like, I whitelist that you can use bold tags, and H1 tags, things like that. Um, and then there's another, there's a header called the, con uh, a header you can set for a content security policy. Um, I really wanted to look more into this because what you can say with this header is you can tell up-to-date browsers that um, I'm only going to load JavaScript remotely from these servers. I'm not going to give you any inline JavaScript and I'm not going to load any JavaScript from servers that I don't define here. So that lets you uh, basically turn off all inline JavaScript, turn off JavaScript from um, servers that you don't whitelist. The downside of the content security policy is that you can no longer do any inline JavaScript at all. So um, it's, I, I, would, I would love to actually look into that to see. I, I learned about it while I was doing this presentation, so it's pretty interesting. Um, okay, so number four, insecure direct object references. Um, this is a fancy way of saying like, I can still right click the file and say like on Facebook they have um, they have uh, you know you think you're sharing your your pictures with just your friends and if I copy and paste the link to the photo on Facebook to somebody who's not your friend they'll log in and they'll get some sort of permission error that says they can't see it but if instead I right click on that photo and copy the image URL I get the CDN path to that image and I can just send that to you and you can view the image so all those photos that people people think are private private on Facebook aren't really. Obviously they can be shared in other ways and we all know that, like I could take a screenshot of that image and send it, it would be a problem, but um, a lot of people don't realize how easy that is. <coughs> There's a related vulnerability that we'll get to I think at number seven, which is a little more applicable to our Rails app. Um, number five is security misconfiguration. <coughs> so web applications have security, have configuration at the operating system, operating system level, the web server level, framework, database, everything in between. Um, and all of those configurations have to be up to date and secure. Um, there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of layers there. Um, like Heroku Postgres, for instance, we found out on one of our client applications the hard way that there is no way to say, like, only allow connections from my dynos. Like, if I have, if I have, if I have an application's connection string, I can connect to it from anywhere in the world. So what we had as a developer mistakenly connect to the production instance and run the tests against that, which ran database cleaner. So that's, a, that's an example of a, miscon of a, I would consider it a misconfiguration to say that I have no way to restrict who can connect to this database outside of the connection string. Um, not one we can necessarily do much about right now, but um, Brian from Code Climate wrote this Rails and Secure Defaults blog post in 2013, and he also did a talk at RailsConf and a bunch of regional conferences about it. So you should check that out. Um, I think mostly as a result of a lot of what he was talking about, a lot of those things got a lot of the things in this blog post get fixed and got fixed in Rails 4 or addressed somewhat in Rails 4. Um, so that's good news. Um, but you should definitely check that post, post out because it's pretty interesting. It talks about a lot of things I'm talking about here as well. Uh, another example is in clearance. Um, the default the default uh, configuration of clearance when you run generate clearance install. Um, will give you a cookie that gets a, that, that stores your session ID that gets sent over HTTP requests. So that can be sniffed out and your session can be hijacked in that way. 
So if you're using clearance, what you really want to do is make sure that in, in that initialization for staging and production, you set secure cookie to true, which means that cookie can only be sent when the connection is over HTTP, which makes it not sniffable unless the cell is broken, which... <laughs> um, it was one time. <laughs> Uh, sensitive data exposure is another one. Uh, I won't get too far into this one, but think of all the sensitive data that we collect uh, from even just names of users to like medical details sometimes, passwords, things like that. So the questions to ask yourself when you're dealing with this data is, um, are we storing it in plain text? Is that okay? Are we transmitting it in plain text? Are we doing that only internally, externally? Is that okay? Um, if this needs to be encrypted, are we using up-to-date encryption algorithms? Um, are we storing the encryption key in the right spot? Are we rotating it? Do we have a policy for rotating it? Things like that. Um, there are some precautions you can take, which are pretty high level, but store as little sensitive data as possible. So Stripe helps us with this when it comes to credit cards. We can handle most of that client side, and as long as we're careful not to even ever send any of that data to the server through forms or whatever, we don't even have any record of what your credit card number was. We just have a token back from Stripe that we can charge. Um, uh, config.filter parameters, if you end up taking like the last four digits of a, of a credit card number, you can filter those out of your logs by adding you know, last four to config.filter parameters, and those won't ever be um, stored in your logs anywhere. And the last thing a lot of people forget is to mind your development environment. If you're working in any sort of medical related thing, this ends up being really important, but I think it's important in a lot of the projects that we do, um, especially if you're doing something like you're going to pull down the production database and you're going to run it locally. So now I have all of this production data on my laptop, which I take on the train, and I take everywhere with me. So um, be, just be conscious of that, and particularly if you're working on anything with sensitive data, um, you probably want to turn on full disk encryption on your Mac or wherever you're using um, so that that data is not stolen. Um, and with medical, medical stuff, you definitely want to do that because there are laws <laughs> in place around that. Missing functional level access control is kind of like the, I, I view that kind of similar to the direct object reference one we talked about. Um, so an example kind of makes this a little more easy to understand. So here's a controller. In the index, I'm saying, give me the, all the current, the current user's projects. And imagine, that I'm, imagine I'm displaying it in a, a list with a delete link next to it. On the destroy action, I just say, find me that ID and destroy it. So I didn't scope them the same way. In the destroy, I'm just going straight through the project, and I say, find me that ID and destroy it. I didn't verify that they belong to the current user in any way. Um, you know, the easy, the easy fix here would be like current user.projects.find params ID destroy. Or a before filter that verifies that the, somehow the pro they're, they're allowed to delete the project that they're passing in. Um, this is pretty obvious, like when you look at it in the context of this presentation, but I see it a lot, even in our projects, um, where we forget to do something like this. So you should look out for it in code reviews. Cross-site request forgery um, is something I think a lot of us have heard, and it's not something, I mean, I think a lot of people don't really understand what it is. So the idea basically is that if I'm an attacker and I know Joe's logged into his bank or something like that, and, his bank, and I know his bank is vulnerable to cross-site request forgery, I can somehow get him to come to my website, think he's like signing up for an email newsletter, and when he clicks submit, I actually send off a request to his bank to transfer money somewhere, right? Because the, the, the bank website is not verifying that the request actually came from its own website. So there's good news on the Rails front here, and that's that Rails handles this reasonably well with protect from forgery. Um, that's what, that's the mechanism for determining that a request comes from the server you think it's coming from. If you're interested in how that works, you can look in that documentation. Um, jQuery UJS plays a part in this in that it helps do the same thing for AJAX requests, which can be tricky with CSRF. And if you're still using Rails 3, then basically those two, the, those two things still apply, but just don't use the match thing in your, the match um, method in your routes, because that's vulnerable to CSRF, and that's explained in that um, Rails Insecure Defaults article if you're interested in that. Number nine is using components with known vulnerabilities. So all of the components we use, operating systems, servers, Ruby, Ruby gems, Rails, things like that, they all have security issues. And staying on top of those is uh, important. 
So there's a thing called Bundler Audit, which I, um, which I think we have a research card for. I don't know if it's actually in suspenders yet, but it will run, um, we're considering running it as part of Rake, which will tell you whether or not there's any known security vulnerabilities against the gems in your bundle. Um, you can update them there. Uh, there's these two mailing lists for Ruby and, and uh, Rails developers that are really low volume. They're just announcements of um, security issues. So I would suggest uh, signing up to those. I think the Rails one has, has some discussion involved, so it's a little higher volume, but it's not super high volume at all. Um, and number 10 <laughs> is unvalidated redirects and forwards. So another an example here makes it makes it easier. So you'll often see something like this where you'll go to a link, you'll go to like mysite.com slash products and you'll end up on mysite.com slash sign in with a return to parameter back to products. Um, an attacker can look at this and say, well, what happens if I go to this web, I, I send this link, sign in, and I set return to to my phishing website where I'm going to ask you to reset your password. Um, if the website is, if the, if mysite.com is not careful in checking that that referrer belongs to it, it'll just happily redirect to the phishing website, which can be made to look like my site, and now the user, now they can collect the user's current password and tell them they're rotating their password and send them back somewhere. Um, so there's some good news here, and that's that Clarence handles this for you. Um, Clarence does have that return to functionality, but it is careful to only send it to the current, only send it to the current site. Um, if, you're do, if you're implementing this for yourself somewhere, there's this um, redirect to takes this path only parameter. So you can say, ignore the host that's in the, the URL that I'm sending you. Um, yep, yeah, so that's the top 10. Um, there's some tools that we can use to kind of help us along the way here to help us avoid a lot of these problems. The first one is suspenders. Um, I was planning on taking a look to see if how, how much of this stuff we can address in suspenders or how much we already are addressing in suspenders. Um, like the clearance thing I looked, clearance is no longer actually in suspenders, so that's not a place where we can address it. We're trying to address it actually in clearance, but we'll see how that goes. Um, we have the code climate security monitor. Um, on a lot of projects I've been on, there are like alerts that just kind of sit here and nobody's really sure what to do. If that happens, just ask in code. Be like, I got this security monitor alert. Is this something I need to worry about? Is this, uh, you know, what, what can I do? Is this a false positive? Should I not worry about it? Um, and you should basically treat it like a code review. If one of those things comes up and you think it's a false positive, just have somebody else be like, yeah, that's, that's a false positive. Um, and then there's also bundler audit like we talked about and the two mailing lists that we talked about, which are all uh, really good tools. Some references, again, here's the OWASP top 10 list. Um, which has links to each type, each of these things with examples. They also have a Ruby on Rails cheat sheet, which is kind of out of date for the most part, actually, but it does tell you like specifically how Rails is vulnerable to some of these things. Some of it, like I said, is a little out of date. Um, and, oh, and then the Rails and Secure Defaults link is there. Um, and then there's this really good book, which I like flipped through a couple years ago and when I was getting interested in this type of stuff. Um, so if you're interested in it, you should read that book. Um, it basically teaches people who are interested in security how people who wanted to hack your application would go about looking for vulnerabilities and what the, what the type of things that they look for. That's it.